Hello and welcome to the TT Podcast. This is the podcast where we talk to one person from the world of the TT racers to discuss their lives, their journeys, their ambitions and their relationship with the greatest motorsporting event in the world. I'm Chris Pritchard and alongside me, as ever, Steve Plater. You alright Steve? Hey Chris. Good mate, thanks. Looking forward to this one. What are we expecting out of this this guy, this um, enigma? I think this boy's made history on a TT course, you know, and can be a difficult character at times, but I think as long as we get him relaxed, he'll open up. Are you going to give him a quick massage? <laughs> you can get him a chicken sandwich again. <laughs> I feel like I have to explain this, this, this chicken sandwich joke. So working for RST a few years ago, I ended up popping up to Hutch's to do some interviewing. Now, I don't know if he thought I was a Deliveroo rider or something, because I rock up there. He said, have you had dinner? I said, yeah, yeah, I've had dinner on my way up. It's like, oh, I'm really hungry. It's like, all right. He said, uh, can, you, can you go to a shop for me? I'm like, well, what do you say to Ian Hutchinson? You don't say, oh, no, mate, go on, get yourself off there. So I was like, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll go. What do you want? He was like, get us a chicken sandwich. <laughs> You've never bought me anything. You never asked. But if you asked, I'd definitely get you one. Shall we get into it? Let's crack on. <laughs> For today's episode of the TT Podcast, we are joined by Ian Hutchinson. Where to start with this man? The fourth most successful solo racer of the Isle of Man TT racers, with 16 victories and 27 podium finishes. He's the fifth fastest man ever around the TT course, having lapped at an average speed of 133.115 miles an hour and he is the only man in the 115-year history of the TT to have won five races in a week. Those are some of his career highlights, but he's had more than his fair share of lowlights. Crashes, injuries, setbacks, and over 40 surgeries in total. How does he do it? Why does he do it? Well, let's see if we can find out. Probably the best intro you've ever had there, Ian. What do you think to that one? <laughs> Took you long enough. Oh, one take. That, that was not supposed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> From the top again. <laughs> it's fine. How are you? You all right? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Yeah. Good. Glad to be here? Well, taking a while, I suppose, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Listen, they'll have edited it. It's going to sound absolutely amazing. Um, we start the TT podcast with the same question to every every person that comes in here. Obviously, you've been listening to them all, so you know what question's coming up. You've been on the start line, what, 68 times now, I think, for a TT start. What's it feel like rolling up through that gantry? You're in no man's land, you get that hand on your shoulder, you're waiting for that flag to drop, you get that tap on that shoulder. What's going through your mind during those moments? You have so many different thoughts depending on how your race is looking like it's going to turn out, I think. Um, I think if you have a really good practice week and you're up there, um, you're never in a situation where you sort of know you're going to go out and just win by a mile. So if you've had a good practice week, you've more pressure on your shoulders a bit knowing that you're in a race today you know whereas if you haven't and things aren't quite right with your bike it's you could you could have a bike that's real hard work and then you're thinking this is going to be a long race and hard work or it's somewhere in between where you probably don't think you're going to win but your bike's quite nice to ride so you could have a good day out riding around the Isle of Man you know which is it's hard to enjoy because you're not well I'm not there for that you know so end up being a bit grumpy in that situation but um you know I've it, it changes so much and you literally can't go and win every single race every year of your career. I think you're one of the only riders that's come in here though and and not mentioned the word nerves. Like, are you nervous going into it? Or again, is it down to how you're expecting that race to go out, whether you're going to be nervous or do you not feel any nerves? I think uh, the, the nerves I feel are from like not winning rather mm -hmm. than nervous of anything else happening, you know. Um, it, the thought of going out when you've been having a real strong practice week and you are there just to win um that sort of builds up your nerves thinking i don't want to let everyone down i don't want to let mm -hmm. myself down. you know i want to go win the race and that brings pressure with it no matter who you are you know if you don't if you don't feel pressure in that situation <laughs> there's something wrong with you so yeah I, i'm not i'm never that nervous unless, unless i've got a bike that does strange things or whatever which occasionally happens <laughs> then you're a bit nervous because you don't want anything going wrong like that but yeah it's it's a, a funny 
funny race really but it's the same in any race you know if you if you qualify if you if you're used to running somewhere near the front in a british championship race and you have some that go on that weekend and you end up starting from 15th 20th you, you have a different nerve set because you're racing with different people and you, you know it's yeah it can happen with any race i think so those nerves you know the tap on the shoulder how does that relate to you fly helicopters your first ever solo flight uh <laughs> Yeah, that's scary, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Remember, get man was at Beverly, so took me over to Beverly, a little grass field, and landed it in there. And it circuits is your first solo flight. You just have to do circuits of the field. So you hover at the end of the runway, do a nice uh, transition away, circuit downwind, um, and then turn in for your finals, and sort of hover across the runway and do that six times. So you do it with your instructor, and then you come in and land and then he gets out and straight away it's the first time obviously you've been on your own because it's your first solo the helicopter flies on its side because there's no weight in one side <laughs> so you set off across field because you're used to picking it up <laughs> with someone there and yeah. you've got your your cyclic way you normally have it and you're like oh where am i going where am i going, where am I going? <laughs> and you just tend, tend to like tense up i think and yeah so getting up there is a lot going on i was in a cab Carb one when I was learning, so you had to pull car beat to come down, and so you've all that going on. And there has been mistakes with that in the past, and people have had carb freeze on them. So, um, so on a percentage, tap on the shoulder to first solo flight, mm, which is the worst. I think being up in the air is the worst, isn't it? <laughs> hey, let's before we get into TT 2022, then, um, let's talk about this this flying experience because I remember we did a, a an RST photo shoot at Mallory. Everyone stood around waiting for Ochi. Where's Ochi? Where's he going to be? Like expecting the car to roll up. This helicopter just flies in, <laughs> just drops it down, walks out of it. Rockstar. It, yeah, as if it's normal. <laughs> I'm like, what the? So where did the where did the the passion come from from aviation? Is there any, or did you just want to be able to get around a lot quicker? No, I think with helicopters, I mean, there's, there's probably not many kids, uh, probably from like 10 years up or something, that could not look at a helicopter flying over you. You know, if you hear a mm -hmm. helicopter, you have to look, don't you? And that's how I've always been. Never even contemplated being able to fly one and would have loved to just go in one. Um, and then I just got this, I can't even remember what year it was, maybe 2016. I just got this urge and just thought, if I don't do it now, I'll never do it, you know. I've, I've never been, like, the brightest with exams and all that, so I thought, you know, the older I get, that's not going to get any better. <laughs> so I just thought, I'm going for it, you know, and then my dad was like, oh, just remember when when it's all, all your racing's finished, you might not be able to fly one. I said, yeah, but then I'll look back and I've done it, won't I? Whereas if you've never done it, you've never done it. So I thought, right, I'm doing it. So, uh, I mean, I know the, the guys and girls up at... Um, Helijet now, obviously, well. But when I walked in, knowing them now, they probably thought, what a prick. Because <laughs> I just walked straight in and went, right, I want to learn to fly. Uh, I've got uh, six months to do it in, and uh, I can come every day and walk back out. <laughs> so I can, if I dropped a pen that recorded what they said when I left out there, it would have been quite amusing. I think I actually said three months at the start. Anyway, I did do it in seven months. But the biggest hold-up really was the, the written exams. You've got to keep going through. There's nine to do. So you really do have to rehearse them, and you have to take a bit of time. Some of them, navigation and the weather ones and stuff, they're quite hard. To You're not just going to guess the answers. Yeah. Plus, you really do need to know them. Do they do them all separately, or do they do them in a the block? Yeah, you have to... Not, not totally separately. It's really weird how it works. You have to do them all within a certain time so you can't spread it too much and then you're only allowed to have something like three sittings so you have to double up on some yeah you have to do two or three at once so you choose the easy ones to do obviously at once and then do a hard one on its own and i can't remember exactly how it was but i remember having to do a few at a time and yeah so that that there was no way of really making that much shorter um the flying thing i would have quite happily gone up there every day and at some points i did go up every day and did an hour or two of flying um but when they tell you you can do your first solo flight at 30 hours you're winging it really did you feel ready for it when you did what at that point or not mm, yeah to do the circuits i suppose i was i was i mean if something goes wrong you are not ready for it are you you're not ready for no. it no even when i passed i passed it about i was i went in for my test at late 60 hours 
And then the weather caught us out a few times, so I ended up doing more hours before it got rescheduled. So I ended up probably mid 75 hours or something, which they sort of say 100 hours is the right time to do it. Um, but everybody's different, so mm -hmm. you can go a bit quicker. I think because I was flying regularly as well, I think if you go up there a couple of hours a week, you're not going to be quite as sharp when it comes to it. So, But yeah, even when I passed, there's a lot of stuff like, it's all right flying around the area you're in all the time and then going into a little grass airfield and stuff. But straight away, I was like, right, I'm off to the Isle of Man. <laughs> I'm off to the Northwest. I'm off to Goodwood. Like the flight to Goodwood's <clears throat> massive. You go through so much airspace yeah. and like cross the back of Heathrow. And there's, there's must Mil be military ten. fields as well. Yeah. As, yeah. There's about 10 airfields to get round like to that west side of Heathrow down to that's a fair old flight like and you've got to know what you're doing radio and all that so you're not just flying straight in a direct straight line just boom yeah you can a little you can there's certain bits you can't to overfly mm -hmm. and there's some airfields you'll call up to get permission to cross and they yeah. might not give you it depending on what's going on so then you've got to go around it a bit but um yeah i mean a lot of people fly around them nearly all their life when they're flying you hear mm. them on the radio they're just dead they don't have confidence to ask to cross <laughs> and stuff like that but you know when when there's a big <laughs> like jet two plane waiting to come in or something and they're waiting for you to cross you need to know what you're saying and what you're doing yeah. really and i think i picked a bit lead where i learns literally on the side of the runway at leeds bradford so whenever you leave, you've got to speak to Leeds Bradford Airport to get out of there, and you have to be sharp because they're busy. The the if they if they hear that you're like not quite on it on the radio, they'll just make you go around. They're not even interested in yeah. trying to help you in that sense, you know. But then I've had it where I've come back in a bit of sketchy weather, and they do help you, you know. So, but yeah, it's it, it, there's a lot more to it definitely. And I've set off and thought, oh God, this is a bit of a mission. Like got your iPad on the go with. Sky Demon, which is like a sat nav thing, and it's binging up this warning, binging up that you can't cross this. Is this here? Is this here? You can't do this height, and it's like there's a lot going on. Have you had any near misses? No, I've not had near misses. I've had um, a couple of weather. I went to Croft for a track day once, and uh, I was in the Jet Ranger. What a rock star! I went to Croft for a track day in and my I, Jet Ranger, and when I come back. <laughs> It was windy, and and you know when you get that light feeling, that's the only thing you can't really do anything about. So you're on, you're on the collective all the time, ready to drop it. <laughs> and then I landed like I just couldn't wait to be on the ground. Really, you yeah. want to get back, but I couldn't wait to be on the ground. Yeah. My, my hands were sweating. I was like, <laughs> I don't need another day like that. <laughs> um, and then I've come back from Donington end of last year, getting towards the end of winter. It was October. Did a little club race <laughs> and went in the jet range <laughs> hey, if you, I love it if you've got one, <laughs> hey, you've got one. <laughs> uh, yeah it's about a 20 minute flight instead of a two hour drive so yeah. um, but it was getting dark quick so you fly you're allowed to fly 30 minutes before sunrise and 30 minutes after so uh, yeah it was getting touch and go coming in and there was a bit of a storm brewing and uh, Leeds say can you can you let us give us uh, when you've got visual on the airfield and I know at which point you normally have visual, and I didn't. <laughs> so I was like, ooh, should I be telling them I have all? <laughs> yeah, so that that was, yeah, I touched down with about a minute to spare, and it was pretty dark. Really? Pretty dark, and it was a two-day meeting, so I went back up on the Sunday morning at like seven in the morning. It was the same guy on, and I called, rang up to book out, and uh, he went, that was pretty dark last night. I was like, yeah, it was, wasn't it? <laughs> it was because of the clouds, you know, it was still yeah. legal to fly, but it was dark. Rather you than me. I'm going to stick to uh, terra firma. Right, shall we talk about TT 2022? Yes. Right, in a nutshell, sum it up for us. Disappointing. Yeah? Hmm. I mean, I, I look at the result and I see RST Superbike Race fourth place. With the guys that, that are in front of you, what what more could you have done? Like, do you take that as a good result or do you look at that and go, well, I'm, I'm not winning, so I'm not happy? Yeah, I mean, here there was a couple of breakdowns which made it look better. But um, I mean, even when people say, oh, you should be like looking for a podium or whatever, I know you, you listen to races and if they don't say, oh, if I'm not winning, you know, they're saying that to please other people really and make people believe that they can win. But when you've won 16 TTs, a podium's not joyful, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's not, it's probably worse than not being up there because you just like makes it, rubs it in even more that you're up there. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm i literally there to add to the win tally. So, you know, what we had this year was not doing that. So it was disappointing. D 
did you think prior to going to the TT? Obviously, I'd, I've heard you speak about that BMW and you picked the BMW because you knew it was a bike that's capable of winning. Did you go there thinking you could get right back up to where, where Hickey is, where Dean is, and be competing for those wins? Yeah, I mean, it, going back to sort of where I was in 17, winning then with 133 laps and racing those guys, um, Hickman's obviously come on since then. Um, but... The lap times that went in, was it 18, the lap records, all that? Yeah. yeah. So so it was weather-related, and I've been there and done that. Obviously, 16 was mega fast, 17 wasn't, because we had f however many days of rain and stuff, yeah. and I was still the same rider on exactly the same bike. You couldn't do the same times. A bit like this year, so... So, you know, I knew... What, I, why Why is that for, for the general public? Why? Why is that? I think, like, you'll see in practice week, every single night, the time gets a little bit faster... And it isn't just changes with your bike. You, you know, you learn a bit more, you get a bit more comfortable, you push a bit harder every night and, and time comes. So if you have five days in a row, Monday to Friday, of getting a little bit faster and then you race on Saturday, your pace is going to be massive. And then a whole other race, a week, a race week until senior day of just learning more and more and more. And the faster you go, your bike changes setup-wise and stuff, so you make changes for that. Whereas if you miss three or four days in practice week, you're basically racing on Tuesday instead of on mm. Saturday, you know. Mm. So it's like going, right, well, I've one night's practice and race. You're not going to break any lap records, are you? So that's what happens when the weather goes, really. So, yes, I sort of knew that I was still capable of going there and, and fighting for wins. Um, so then the accident in 17 scuppered it a bit. And... Um, the two years, 18, 19, 18 was tough. My frame came off five days before the Northwest, and it would have been on for another six weeks if it mm. wasn't for the Northwest. So I went to the grid on a walking stick at the Northwest and at the TT, which is not <laughs> ideal. Not really fighting for wins <laughs> position, is it? But, you know, I was grateful that Honda sort of still stood by me and ran me then, and I had a two year deal with them, which they stood by for the second year. And the second year, I did really well in testing you know I've, I've, i felt comfortable with the bikes i was riding them good lap times were showing good at where we were riding i, I had a lot of hope for the bikes um that year and came off at the 11th you know and that was it again really and mm -hmm. i was lucky in some respects that it did rain for four days then because i couldn't even stand up the day after nothing had broken but i'd rattled my bad leg up the curb at 140 mile an hour and bounced off a rector's hell bale and i definitely felt second hand <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I got back that night and went back to the house, stopping the house, and about one o'clock in the morning, just no sleep, aching. My leg was killing. I said, I'm going to have to go get, th get this x-ray because, like, there's so much going on with my leg. Like, anything, I'm, not, I'm never sure whether it's broken or not. I've walked off on it before when it's been broken. So <laughs> so I went down to Ronald's way at one in the morning and had some x-rays and stuff, and it was okay. So came back, and then I got a phone call Tuesday morning, medical officer, can you come for your medical? I was like, yeah, I'll come up um, about five o'clock before practice starts. Practice got cancelled. Wednesday morning, he rang me, can you come? Yeah, I'll be there about five o'clock before <laughs> got cancelled, thank God, like, because I couldn't even walk. So by the time it had got round to about Thursday, or it might have even been Friday, was it, before we got out, I was in physio in the paddock, and he walked through physio and saw me there and sort of assessed me in there, so... Yeah, I was able to ride again, but it was gone. You know, there was I couldn't even stand up on the pegs or anything. So that was um, a like massive disappointment, really. In nineteen, yeah, that's mental, isn't it? You, you're not, you're not, you can't even walk yet. Yeah. You, you, you yeah. lie, beg, steal, and borrow just to uh, hook your leg <coughs> over a bike, and once you're on the bike, so just going back from that, you know, eighteen when you when you for the northwest you took the cage off or had it taken off um earlier than what you should have done really do you regret that now or would you do you think you maybe <clears> should have left that on and missed the northwest and i don't regret it because regardless of it being ready to come off or not i still got to ride around the tt for two weeks yeah. which is exactly what i did in 2012 on the swan bike you know that was the same situation frame was well that was worse actually because my leg had got infected and the bone was all mashed up so I knew that I was in for an 18 month setback I was I'd missed 11 and I was going to miss 13 so I was going to miss 12 as well so three years I thought I'm done at this you know um if I miss all that 
So I sort of begged my surgeon to take my frame off and made that key. He put it in a cast and I made the carbon cast to ride in 2012 with. Uh, and I think it paid off because then I got two weeks of riding around the swan bike. Didn't actually do that bad. I think I got a six on the 600. Yeah. And then missed 13, come back 14, and then won again in 15. So I was sort of on the same wavelength of thinking it's not as bad as it was then, but I can't miss a year, you know. People like Connor, you know, he had that humongous crash, but he never missed a year at the TT, straight back to it. So when you miss a year, it's definitely hard. Because mm. even, you know, coming back and riding injured and it ended up, even though it was three years, I still snuck that one year in in between in 12. So, yeah, I think it was still worth doing in 18. Um, if anything had gone wrong, it would have been bad news. Like, well, I had to go and do all these races to get um, the signatures. So um, we went to do a club race at Mallory and Neil Tuxworth and everyone was there from Honda. It was, like, it was embarrassing, really. A full factory a Honda race. and blooming superbike there. I'm at a club race and I was on a walking stick. I was like being lifted onto the bike and I only just won. <laughs> yeah, it was like... I said, MCN put, oh, Hutchie wins his first race back. I'm like, Jesus Christ, if I couldn't win that race. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I'm yeah. But it wasn't, you know, the times were pretty good, really, so it wasn't, like, to be sniffed at, but, yeah. So I think it was, yeah, definitely the right thing to do. So then 19 going wrong. I think the fastest lap I did in 18, 19 was 127 over the whole fortnight for those two years, having been doing 133s. And then we had COVID for... 2021 that's what i was going to ask you know you just said you know if you miss a year obviously through injury it does affect you but obviously you and everybody else have missed two you know three years in between of course um how do you think that affected the pace in general and people people coming back for 20 for this year for 22 i think when you're coming back as the only rider that's injured it's different because everybody else is still out there doing it you know um you're missing out i've been stood on the sideline with a frame on watching i actually watched at bottom of bagara in 2011 and i thought i've never seen anything like it i thought i will never be able to do that again mm. it looked ridiculous but when you're there with like a lot of pain in your leg and a frame on everything looks painful yeah. <laughs> you know because you're in pain so yeah it I think because nobody went for two years and you weren't trying to fight back from an injury, you were just you just weren't going down the TT. It was never going to be the same. And I, I thought the pace would come back. Uh, as it happens, it won't lap record pace or anything, but it was fast. Um, and, yeah, just not like coming back from an injury, I'd say. Yeah. Well, let's let's go back all the way to the start because your introduction into to racing... Not something you kind of see nowadays. Kids normally, it's in their blood. So their their dad's a racer or their granddad's a racer and they're brought up through the paddock and they just naturally get into it. But you had no interest in it when you were younger. You had very little interest when you moved into your kind of your 20s and you just got your road bike. So I guess right back at the start when you got your first trial bike, how did that come about? And before that, what were you doing? What were your sports did you have any passions? How how was life then? Yeah, one that I had no interest. Just it was just out of reach for my family, you know, motorcycles. So right. I remember the uh, school that I went to. I was probably eight years old or something around that area, and um, I met a friend there and went to his house. And he had a TO8, and he lived at the back of a golf course. The minute I saw the TO8 in the garage, I was like, "Can we get that out?" <laughs> and like, you know, it's like when you when. Like now, the helicopter's out there, you think you'd be in it every single day, but when you've got it and, it, yeah. and you can be, you're not, you know. That was what it was like for him. He was like, oh, I'm not really bored. I was like, let's get the TOA, let's get the TOA. <laughs> I think he must have thought, you're using bastard. Every time you come around, you want to get the TOA. So I had a little go around on this golf site. Like, we weren't supposed to be on it, so this golf track. And then um second time I saw him, it was in his dad's uh, unit that was like all stacked out with racking. So I had a little ride round there on it, and then that was it from that age till I moved schools and went to, uh, I had to do one year at a middle school before a grammar school, and I was probably 14, 15-ish. And there was a lad there called Martin Crossway that was youth British trials champion at the time. Mm -hmm. And he could walk up a snicket from my house to where he lived, and it, his dad had all these fields on land that he used to go out. He's literally, it was like a job for him. He'd come home from school, trials bike out, 
go ride it for two or three hours practice, come back. His dad had fed late. That was it every single day of his life. Mm -hmm. So I run up there to go watch him and uh, begged him for a go on this gas gas. It was um, lime green and purple gas yeah. gas. Remember them? Yeah. Quite, quite yeah. old, obviously, but 95 or something like that. Night, yeah, maybe even earlier than 91, maybe. I can't remember. But yeah, so I begged him for a go and it got on it. And um, I grabbed the brake with the throttle on and not, I can't remember exactly what happened. I was like 14, but took the front and something mm. punctured my knee into an artery it was just gushing blood out so his mum took me to hospital to get this fixed and we were going on holiday the week after so i came back with a half leg cast up the back of my leg keeping my leg straight on crutches this massive bandage wrapped around it dropped me off at home my mum went mental <laughs> just absolutely I'll mental bet. at me anyway all calmed down because because they were against motorbikes really so it wasn't the injury and we're going on holiday it was more like we told you so there was two things my, my mum in particular were, were against rope swings and motorbikes. My sister brought both her wrists on a rope swing oh. and we had one up in the woods above us that we used to sneak to. It was massive rope swing, legendary thing. Like <laughs> so many people got hurt on it. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that was the two no-nos for me. So when I turned up like this, it didn't go down well. So why, why was she so against motorbikes? Just a danger thing. Right. Yeah, just dangerous. Nothing had happened pr prior. No, no. Right. Just from a dangerous yeah, aspect, yeah. Well, so you know they can be. But I think from then on, then I just begged and begged and begged for a trials bike. So my dad had like got me a TY one seven five. So mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, like I say, I was self employed, didn't have piles of cash to throw at motorbikes mm -hmm. and stuff. So it was a pretty ropey old thing, like, and the, <laughs> like compared to what my mate had, this gas gas thing at the time was as trick as you could get. And I've got a nineteen seventy odd. <laughs> TY175. So was it to just blast around the fields or did you want to go and do trials like do the tricks, do the bunny hops? Well, that's all I knew from watching him then. Yeah. So I'd not really seen any. I didn't know any other motorcycling. I didn't I didn't know about racing or motocross or anything. Um, obviously, the TY80 had been riding my trials bike, but we never really used it as a trials bike. So, yeah, then uh, I'd be up at his, like, try to do trial. And there's a massive quarry by us called the Flap It. That on a Sunday, I mean, it was just stacked with bands. I don't think you were supposed to go there, but there's probably 100 bikes there every Sunday. Yeah. Um, and it was pretty much all trials because there wasn't really... The odd, the odd person turned up with a motocross bike, but there was no track or anything. So, And I think my dad got sick of being sat in the van whilst I was off trialling like a big quarry, so he couldn't really follow you around. So he bought one then, and he was bad at riding motorbikes <laughs> back then. <laughs> What was your dad's background prior to that? Not into bikes at no, all? No, furniture, rugby, rugby, and then he was always been in furniture. Yeah. It was a family business, so yeah. But the amount of times I've seen him loop a bike halfway up the hill was just <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> so he got a TY 250. Um, so that was it. You know, I, I, I really, I'm really glad, like, motorbikes brought a lot of fun to me, but looking back now, I had a lot of years with my dad that I wouldn't have had, mm. you know, we, every Sunday we were up, up to the flap it Sunday morning. That was it. That was, we spent the day doing that. And my dad did get better. He rode, you know, we were like trying to ride up a certain rock, both of us. And, you know, it was mega just going and doing that with your dad. And so, yeah, if nothing else had ever happened, that that was great to do with him. Um, and then that led on to me wanting a better trials bike, getting better. I actually did some British Championship rounds. On mm. a, I, I ended up doing um, uh, my school. What do you call it when you when you go and do a job apprenticeship. experience? Apprenticeship, work, work experience. experience. Work experience. Work experience. Sorry. Yeah. I did it at Colin Apple Yard, which is in Keithley, not far from me. Um, and then blagged a job to work on Saturday mornings for them nice. there. So yeah, they they were like imported a few or sold a few trials bikes, and they lent me a, f a Fantic section, quite a brand new thing. So I ended up doing some British Championship trials on that and and just trialling you know, all the time. Um, and then left school and went there to do my apprenticeship. So yeah. Were you any good on uh, the trial of British uh, Championship? Or probably not a British Championship. I, mean, I, can, I, can, I can't actually remember it, but I've got some pictures of me going up some massive rock for me, like not like indoor trial stuff nowadays, but... Big rocks, and I, and it was a, it was a British trial, British Championship somewhere down south. So yeah, I can't actually remember doing it, but I seen the pictures and I know it was a British Championship trial. 
So, yeah, I wasn't bad, but when you're up against, like, I became friends with Dougie Lampkin and Martin Crossway was British yeah. Trials champion, Dan Clark was British champion, Hemingway's. I was up against it, you know, coming in at the age I was at. Big names, yeah. So, yeah, they'll always say I'm shit, but <laughs> if I go out with any of road racers, <laughs> they're shit. Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've trialled with you. You're a lot better than I am. <laughs> Can you trial? No, but um, I like it. I enjoy it, and I, and I yeah, ride. Yeah, we did two-day yeah. Manx trial. Didn't yeah, yeah. Manx, the international two-day pre-65 trial. Yeah. I'm doing it again this year. Mint. Yeah. So then did that get knocked on the head once you'd become uh, a bike mechanic? Yeah, no, I uh, carried on with it. Uh, I can't remember where it sort of came to a stop. Probably because Appies went, your shit, we're taking the bike back. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably where it ended. Yeah. But um, there were there were a group of three, three lads were come into Apple Yards, they came on there, one had an RGV, a bit of a scrappy thing, black bike, where he'd put all Budweiser stickers in purple up it. <laughs> one had an absolutely immaculate Gullarm CBR 400, mm -hmm. and the other had a KR1S. And they're, they're just young lads, I thought, they're cool, you know, them, them bike, they'd come down for a tyre or whatever. And then they happened to drink in a local pub, it, it never my local pub, it was a mate of a mate, and then we ended up going there, and then they'd come into car park on these bikes, and then I got to know them through that, and... Then it, as soon as I did my apprenticeship, I left Apple Yards and went to uh, Alan Jeffries to mm -hmm. be a mechanic. I never wanted to be. There was a lad there called Lee Morton. He used to race two fifties. Yeah. Great guy. And uh, he was always the apprentice. He was like tw late twenties by then, but he was still classed as the apprentice. He was a full blown mechanic. I thought yeah. I don't want to be that. Yeah. You know, I've, I'm done now. So yeah, ended smart. up going to Jeffries, and then there was a teaser R two fifty RRSP got traded in i saw it i just loved it like way too it was like seven grand or something i was on about 150 quid a week but <laughs> i was like yeah get me financed up on that <laughs> so i ended up buying it and going out with these lads and they were so i was 17 passed my test that was a trauma passing my test as well they were just changing the rules but that's a massive story <laughs> took, took about five times so <laughs> you didn't pass first time no <laughs> <laughs> pass for going too slow, pass for, uh, fail for going too slow, fail for going too fast. Got knocked off by a kid on my way there. Like, honestly, absolute <laughs> mission to pass my test. <laughs> and then on the on the like first of January that year, the the year after, they were changing the rules, and you'd have had to have been twenty one. That'd have been it. I'd have never raced oh, right, or anything yeah, yeah. if I'd missed that. So I'd had all these going from September to December. My last chance was this cancellation in Doncaster on the eighteenth of December. And I had to take it on my mum. My mum had a Fiat Panda and a bike trailer for the trials bike. So I put a, <laughs> Appies had lent me a DT125R trick as anything, big purple motocross thing. I kept failing on that. I went, I can't go on that thing anymore. I need that GS125, like shitty yeah. GS. It was new, but I put my dad's wax jacket on. I put luminous yellow stripe. Look, I <laughs> drove to Doncaster. Didn't have a clue where I was going. Parked in the Morrison's car park, pulled the bike off, went to the test centre. Went on my test. You know, if they don't say left or right, you're meant to go straight on. So I came to this junction and it was slightly uphill and all I could see were millions of cars crossing. I thought, oh, I must have missed this job. Must You must have only been able to go left. So I've got my indicator and everything, done my checks, turning left. As soon as I crested the hill, you could have gone straight on. My heart just, I was like, that's it, yeah. finished. So the rest of the test was shit, really. Got back and I was past. He's like, you, you seem surprised to blow in the wrong way. He said, you did, but you didn't do anything wrong, so I can't fail you for that. It's like, fuck it, oh, no. Brilliant. <laughs> so that was it. Big wheelie to celebrate. And <laughs> <laughs> off we went. So, yeah. Anyway, I skipped off. Wait, I can't remember what story I was on before. <laughs> so you were just running into racing. Yeah, yeah, so I got the T's and R and uh, went out with these boys. They're, they're like 21, 22, and they were pretty fast. So out on a Sunday, was like, I needed to be on on the pipe really to, to, to stay with them you yeah. know ended up like pretty quick so but funny we used to meet at garage and there's a group of lads that were probably mid 40s that used to come out with us uh one of them owns acorn sailors now and he's worth about 100 million quid <laughs> He used to, they used to come out with us, and Matty had got there before me, and I used to do stoppies and wheelies everywhere on this teaser. I had massive front discs and, like, no way, twin discs. Could do rolling stoppies at, like, 60 mile an hour. So I came up, Matty pulled up, and he must have been doing a little wheelie or something, and this group of 40-odd-year-olds are waiting for us all. And then I came over at Crest doing a 60 mile an hour stop you straight past petrol station. Matty said, them lot went, oh, for fuck's sake, who's this coming out with us? <laughs> 
<laughs> so yeah, we used to go up to Coniston and up there, Devil's Bridge Road, you yep. know, every single Sunday, Wednesdays to Sherburn, mega. Just crash a teaser dar, flipped it. First trip to Alaman actually. <laughs> Got off the ferry looking for the digs. We had a B and B or whatever, and because they had bigger bikes, they were like doing wheelies at all road ends. I loved wheelies, but it was hard to do on teaser, especially from low speed. I'll bet. Flipped it, bounced it off a parked car, and a total disaster. <laughs> anyway, I went up to Dennis Trollope and got it fixed. And I had to hammer my back wheel straight, and it split the rim, so I had to put an inner tube in. <laughs> so I did 10 days around the Isle of Man vibrating its nuts off with an inner oh, tube. In. What year was this? 97. That was, that was your first visit? Yeah, so I knew DJ yeah. a bit then, because obviously yeah. working at Jeffries, so I was interested in what Dave was doing and Nick yeah. Jeffries. And, yeah, that was the first visit. So we're in a and b that time. Then eventually the, the teaser dad died completely. I, I I was like too busy looking over my shoulder at a cop car at Side at Road and I ran off Side at Road near a tree. <laughs> and it definitely <laughs> died. <laughs> the bottom of the fork leg went through the front cylinder. <laughs> so I've still got a bit of front wheel actually from it. Beautiful bike, shame to do that to it, but anyway. After hearing all this, there's hope. There's literally hope for anybody out there to race and win the CT. Isn't there? There's hope for you. There isn't there. <laughs> I reckon between 17 and 20, I must have had between cars and bikes at least 10 crashes. And then from 20, touch wood to now, I've not crashed anything. <laughs> not out of racing. Don't say that. <laughs> so yeah, then I moved on to a ZX uh, ZXR 400. They moved on to 750s, and Craig got a Fireblade. And then eventually I got a Fireblade. So I was 19 with a twin headlight Fireblade and I had a Peugeot 205 GTI dimmer. You know, it was just all looking like it was going to go wrong, wasn't it? I bet your <laughs> mum loved you for that, didn't she? That Look died as well, the dimmer. That ended up on its roof. <laughs> <laughs> How did it end up on its roof? That's another long story, that one. <laughs> I think we've got a couple of minutes. That definitely ended up on its roof in a big way. I came out the window. Rolling oh, up the road. My girlfriend out. at the time was trapped in it. I had to kick fuck out of the seat to get her out. <laughs> <laughs> 19, yeah. Not, not, not the best way to cement a relationship. Parents weren't <laughs> amused. Then, then I lost her off the back of I did GSXR stocker. <laughs> and I was running it in on the road. I lost her off the back of it. <laughs> Same girl. Running it in. <laughs> Clutch was slipping. Oh, so at dear. this point, did someone point you in the direction of a track and went, just just go on there and just no, get it still, all out of your system? We, we were still, so I went TT again, 98, 99, slept in van on prom then. So I took the bikes out, parked them on the prom, slept in back of van. Mega time that was, because all the action was down on the prom. Yeah. So we'd go out. All we were really bothered about on Mad Sunday doing laps over the mountain. We used to come over the mountain and then back through Laxey over the mountain. Me and Craig would do like 13 times. On it had gone one way by then, yeah? Only on Mad Sunday. Yeah, yeah. right. So, yeah, it got stopped loads of times. So you were, you were sat at Ramsey a lot of the day. Yeah. Um, and then we'd get back and do wheelies all way up and down Douglas Prom. And that's all the action was there, you know. Mm -hmm. it wasn't, we, we weren't being bad. Everybody did it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. kind of. Yeah, it was quite funny. You could sit, I'd sit on the railings. I'd stand on the railings there drinking. A ferry had come in. Everyone had egged someone on to do a wheelie. And you get people that have never done a wheelie in their life get pressured into clutching <laughs> it. And they'd nearly go down on tram lines and stuff. You're like, oh, everyone cheer. <laughs> someone fell. Everyone would pile over and pick them back up and get them going again. And it was proper fun. But obviously, you could yeah. see how it could go wrong if it did go <laughs> wrong. But, um, yeah, then they sort of caged it off, didn't they, and started doing actual proper stunt displays yeah. and stuff. Did they invite you to the stunt display? No, I, I I've tried to get myself in a few times, but we <laughs> went to Ramsey Sprint and uh, yeah, I'm on the line, all lights went out and, and I just set off steady, climbed up onto the tank and I just sat on the tank wheelie all the way down the prom, got to the other end and went, you meant to go as fast as you can? I went, ah, oh, I'm not bothered about that. <laughs> <laughs> so when did, when did the penny drop then? When did you go, I, I need to give this a go? It, it wasn't really one of their moments. We just went, uh, track days started to come right popular then not not like they are now but yeah we'd heard of this track day thing and we were getting pretty mental on the roads like it was turning into a full blown really <laughs> <laughs> it was turning into a bit of a race mission so yeah i did a track day at cadwell and one at ulton on my zxr 400 and um i must have done one on zxr 4 and then one on fireblade somewhere anyway and then it was like oh i can do without crashing our road bikes on mm -hmm. track days so I don't really know whose idea it was, but I'd moved work again to Hobsport Racing. So race bikes were coming in. I was working on them all the was time. Was that a dyno place? I yeah, that. Grant yeah. used to yeah. come with Sanyo right. Hondas and stuff. Yeah. 
So he kept seeing these race bikes, and there's a guy called Gordon Whitaker who used to race in British Supersport. I raced so against him, yeah. He lent me his GSX-R 600 to do a race on at Mallory. So that was it, really. Did that and bought the bike off him and went went club racing. So I've still got the bike now. Oh, fully Have fund- you? Yeah, I've still got it, yeah. 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 Fully funded by yourself? You're doing yeah. this all off your own well, bike? Yeah, uh, well, sponsored by Visa, but they wanted paying back every month. <laughs> I mean, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they uh, they tend to do that. I ran up some debts like <laughs> nobody knew. I still lived at well. I was living at home with my parents till I was twenty eight. And, and what what and, what were the parents' attitude when you started? I think what my dad couldn't get his head over was since since I've been probably twenty twenty ish maybe I get fifty. Oh, me and my sisters get fifty quid for Christmas. Yeah, still get it now. Fifty quid. That's yep. it. So to buy a tyre... You sound a little bit disappointed with that. Well, Dad. I had this conversation last week with him in Spain, actually. I was like, what do you, what do you think I'm going to buy with 50 quid? It's not about that. It's not about that. <laughs> so, yeah, my mum was the one that used to buy all the little stocking fillers and give you loads of amazing little things to open. And then, um, yeah, 50 quid. So they'd either buy us something at 50 quid or you get 50 quid. So for him to comprehend paying 250 quid for a rear tyre that's going to last 10 laps... Just, mm-hmm. There's no chance, you know. I didn't no. have the money to do it anyway, but he just could not get it. So yeah, I was doing it on my own really, and um, ran up a fair old peak <laughs> visa. <laughs> I ended up with ten cards because they, they let you have another one if you pay off your last one. Yeah, yeah. So you pay off the last one and then use the other one again, and then it just went on and on like that. it got pretty scary. But I was living at home, but I, I sort of had a bit of a get out clause. I bought a seven and a half tonner. Uh, for like three grand and chipped away at converting it into a race trailer and motorhome, yeah, living accommodation. And then I sold that one and did another one. And then the second one was quite a nice thing, you know, it was probably going to cover most of my debts if, it, if I never did anything in racing. But I was still living at home at 27, 28, um, with a mass load of debt and was like never ever going to get out of it. So um, 2006 was sort of the turning point, really, where. I got a free ride for, I was running a, someone had lent me Economy Motorspares, Jeremy, he'd lent me a GSXR 1000 to do British Superstocking. Um, so I won a race at Donington in 2005 against uh, John Lavitt, he was on a build base. Yes. Yeah. So I think he was leading championship or something. Beat him at Donington, mega good race, and it sort of lifted me a bit with everyone's you know, I got some phone calls about riding this, riding that. I'd ridden the Mark Johns Hondas on the roads that year and it, they were problematic, to say the least. <laughs> so, yeah, the road job was hard work. I built a CBR 600 myself for Craig Atkinson. He wanted to do the Manx. He'd been doing the Manx. So I've missed out loads, obviously, but everyone knows the story of life, where I started and stuff, <laughs> doing the Manx. Yeah, and I went and did the Northwest TT in 06 with McAdoo free ride and the prize money from the Northwest TT, everything. I just came home and just wrote a check to all the credit card companies, sort of started afresh and then got my ride with Honda with a Wipe my nose clean. Yeah. The de- yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that was it really, a fresh start there and got got my ride with Honda and started. The rest, is, the rest is history, I guess. Yeah. So I think now is a perfect point to say thank you for part one. We're going to be heading into part two. So make sure you've subscribed. If you want to hear part two, make sure you're uh, following us on TT Officials across all the social media. And we'll be back next week with part two when we hear all about Ian's TT career.